uh, looking forward to that one, so please spread the word, uh, is uh, entitled Sleepy Hollow Revisited, uh, and it will be an actor by the name of Chris Hart who will be portraying uh, Ichabod Crane and taking us back to Sleepy Hollow. So that should be a, an entertaining, at least, uh, membership meeting. Uh, however, uh, tonight, well, and also, if anybody, I'm starting to brainstorm for next year so I can get ahead of the game uh, for scheduling uh, speakers, so if anybody knows of any speakers, Topics are fine, but if you actually know people that speak on topics, that would be even better for me. Um, uh, so let me know. Uh, however, tonight's speaker is uh, Kim Jerkovic. Uh, if I you, said that correct. Great. Okay. Uh, she's the curator of Tuscarawas uh, County Historical Society. Uh, Kim is. Uh, has worked also in the public history field for over 20 years. She holds a bachelor's degree in history from Muskingum College, now University, uh, and has a master's degree in public history from Kent State University. Along with her experience in the County Historical Society, uh, she's been the curator of the J.E. Reeves home uh, down in uh, Tuscarawas County, as well as operating uh, the uh, uh, Dover Historical Society and the Denison Railroad Depot Museum. Uh, so she's a wealth of information. We're very grateful that she's here tonight to share that information with us. Uh, but tonight, again, she will be presenting uh, the Mavarians in the uh, Tuscarora uh, County, and I won't spoil anything. <laughs> so I will turn it over to Kim at this point to talk a little bit. Did you want to be? Okay, I'm going to stand back here by my computer so I can remember to change the slides because if I have somebody else do it, I forget to tell them to change them. So uh, I want to thank you for having me here this evening. I had somebody ask where Tuscarawas County was, so I will explain that. Um, if you go west on 62 to Canton and then go south on 77 for a half hour, you'll run into Tuscarawas County. So. Um, but that's where I'm from. Not too bad of a trip to get here this evening. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Moravians. Um, if you've ever been to Shenbrun Village or Janet and Hutton, uh, those were Moravian missions in the county. So we're going to talk about how those got there. Um, the Tuscarawas County Historical Society is going to celebrate its 100th anniversary in 2021. And that was because Reverend Joseph Wineland, a Moravian minister in the area, was wanting to find where the Schoenbrunn village and the other villages were located. And so he got together with the uh, school superintendents in the area. Uh, they raised some money and they started using the documents in the Moravian uh, library at Bethlehem to find the villages. So with that, in 1921 they started the Tuscarawas County Historical Society. So it's kind of neat that you guys asked me to talk about the Moravians. kind of ties in with our 100th anniversary coming up. So, see I already forgot to change the slide. I had a picture <laughs> of Reverend Joseph Weinland and he's holding the church bell from Shunbrun. That was something that they had um, in the Moravian archives in Pennsylvania. So he has the bell. So I'm going to look at this in three sections. Um, first of all, how did the, or, or what Native Americans were inhabiting Ohio during this time period. Um, how, a little small history of the Moravians. And then we'll talk about the missions and re the Revolutionary War in the area and the tragic end that came to them. So we'll start with the Native Americans. Uh, in the 1600s, the Erie tribe was in the northern part of Ohio and the uh, Shinani were in the Scioto Valley and they were dispersed by the Iroquois or five nations, six nations, um, however we want to term them. Uh, they uh, dispersed them out of there. So in 1700 there really weren't very many uh, Native Americans at all in the Ohio area and then they gradually started filtering back in so that by 1750 in the north was the Wyandotte in the south or the southwest was the Shawnee and then in the Muskingum and Tuscarawas uh, River Valleys were the Delaware Indians. So there's a few important towns. This is a really bad map but <coughs> you know good maps don't exist from the 1700s. Um, but up at the top um, there was the main village that started with the Delaware Indians in Tuscarawas County actually and it was called Tuscarawas which means open mouth. Um, so it had to do with the river. And that was the Delaware capital. Let me see if I got my year. I don't have my year on that one. So that was the first Delaware capital. Uh, moving down the river a little bit, 
there was a town called Three Legs Town. It's kind of right above the Arn River. And then the second capital was, okay, here comes my Indian, Gekulamukpachunk, otherwise known as Newcomer's Town, which is much easier to say. Uh, that was the second Delaware capital, and it's right there uh, below the M in the Muskingum River. And that was established in 1760. And then in 1775, uh, they moved further down the river to Gashokung, otherwise known as Kashokton, which that one kind of sounds the same. So that was 1775, and that's uh, the area underneath the square on the left-hand side. Um, there's a bunch of dots there. So that was the third Delaware capital. Um, so Gashokung was in Kashokton County, not Tuscarawas County, <laughs> but nearby. Um, this area was a crossroads of trails, Indian trails across Ohio. This is a map from 1777 showing the Native American trails, and you can see they just crisscrossed the state. And one of the, I'll just go point to that, right up there is Tuscarawas County. So you can see it's a crossroads of many trails, including the Great Trail. Um, it was the main route between what would be Fort Pitt and Detroit. And so um, it's a, a well-traveled area um, in, in this time period. Um, the first white men into the area were traders and trappers. In 1749, the French came through a lot of the river valleys in Ohio and buried lead plates to claim the land for France. And then in, a year later, in 1750, Christopher Gist came to Ohio on behalf of the Ohio Company of Virginia and surveyed the land. Um, the King of England had deeded over half a million acres west of the Allegheny Mountains uh, to the Pennsylvania and Virginia areas. So this sets the stage. Uh, this is what's going on in Ohio. So now we'll get to the Moravians. Um, we're going to start out in what used to be Czechoslovakia. Uh, to get to the Moravians first. There was a province there called Moravia and there was a secret religious sect there that were known as the Unity of Brethren Church. Uh, now this area was Catholic so the, the sect was outlawed. They weren't allowed to be there so they eventually fled to the Protestant community at Herrenhut in Saxony in Germany and it was the estate of Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf. So Zinzendorf wanted to form a community, a safe community for oppressed religious minorities. So by 1725, there were 90 Moravians living in this village. Um, in 1735, they decided to come to the colonies. So they set out for America and they first go to Georgia. Um, at this point in history, England and Spain are at war and the Moravians are pacifists, so they don't believe in taking up arms. So this becomes a problem when there's fighting with the Spanish from Florida. So they get on a boat and set sail for Philadelphia. Uh, this is in 1739. And by 1741, um, they found the town of Bethlehem in Pennsylvania, and then also Nazareth, Nazareth and Lilith and other frontier towns and they consider these the centers for spreading the gospel, uh, particularly to the Native Americans. <coughs> so in this community of Moravians in Pennsylvania come two men who are essential to the history of the missions in Tuscarawas County, and this was David Zeisberger and John Heckewalder. So Zeisberger was born in Moravia, on Good Friday, April 11, 1721. And his parents came to America, but they left him behind to do studies. Uh, he was left in Irondike, Holland. And then um, he had a gift with languages, and this is going to be seen throughout his career, um, different things he can do with languages. Um, he soon clashes with the strict officials in the church um, while he's studying, and he sets sail for England. He meets James Oglethorpe there, who had founded Georgia, and he secures passage to Georgia and his, the village where his parents are. Uh, John Heckewalder was born in England in 1743, so he's quite a bit younger. And he came with his parents to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania in 1754. So they both enter service as Moravian, uh, Moravian missionaries to the Native Americans, and they both eventually end up in Ohio. Um, Zeisberger's route, he had been chosen to return to Europe after he had been in America for a while. Uh, they wanted him to go back and study some more. 
he was actually on the ship getting ready to set sail and he was looking pretty dejected and a bishop came over him, over to him and asked him what was wrong and he said that his one goal was just to be converted to Christ, to stay in the new world, and to help convert Native Americans. So the bishop could see you know, how much it meant to him. He told him to get off the ship and go back to Bethlehem and to become a mission. So that was the point where he sort of entered the mission field. Um, Heckewelder also originally was not given missions as an original goal. His father set him out as an apprentice to a cooper. So he was going to learn how to make barrels and make barrels for the rest of his life. Uh, that was also not what he wanted to do. It was his goal to be a missionary also. And in 1762, his wish was granted when missionary Christian Frederick Post uh, took him to his cabin in the Ohio Territory to teach among the natives. This was the first white man's cabin, so to speak. Uh, I'm sure there were some trader cabins, but... Chris, uh, Christian Frederick Post gets the credit for the first white man's cabin in Ohio and it was just north of the Stark County line near present day Bolivar and it's on private property today but there is a little um, marker that designates where that cabin was. So Heckewelder gets to go there. Uh, Post actually leaves him there. He's a, you know what, 19 years old and he leaves him there. Uh, there's a Delaware settlement in Tuscarawas. Um, he really doesn't know how to take care of himself. He about starves, uh, doesn't have any good food, gets sick. Well then the, the Delaware there kind of take him in. Um, they put him to work with them building fences, give him some food to eat, and um, he, he kind of gets nursed back to health a little bit. Then Pontiac's war breaks out and it isn't safe for him to stay there, especially alone, and so he's brought back to Bethlehem in November. So this is a, a painting that's in the archives in Bethlehem called The Power of the Gospel, and that is David Zeisberger preaching to the natives. Um, and that was, that was his goal in life. That was what he wanted to do. Um, mission work among the Indians, of course, wasn't a new idea. The Spanish brought Jesuit priests with them whenever they came in the 16th and 17th centuries. The Puritans in New England worked with conversion, especially with John Eliot. And the very first um, Moravian missionary in America was Henry Rauch, and he was in New York. So. We'll start with the work of Zeisberger and Heckewelder in Pennsylvania. Um, it's a tumultuous place. Um, anytime there's clashing between the white settlers and the Indians, things always become a little bit tricky. So the first missions were sort of near Bethlehem. Um, one of the first ones set up in 1775 was also named Janaton Hutton, which we're going to hear that name later. And that one was on the Mahoney Creek. It was destroyed. Um, a group of uh, Native Americans came in and killed some of the inhabitants there. Heck, uh, Zeisberger was actually on his way to the village when this happened, so he was very close to actually um, getting killed himself in one of these first missions. Um, two more were founded near Bethlehem. They were destroyed in 1763. If you've ever heard of the Paxton Boys, um, those were the ones that attacked those villages. Uh, those inhabit inhabitants were able to flee. They make it to Philadelphia, spend quite a bit of time there um, in army barracks. The militia keeps them safe for the time being. Um, once the French and Indian War ends in 1763, then the Moravians decide to take their missions further west, further away from the white settlements, where hopefully they'll um, be a little more stable. So in 1765, the mission of Freedom's Hutton was established on the Susquehanna River. Uh, there was another established at the headwaters of the Allegheny River. And then, and uh, that's 1870, 1770, <laughs> Friedenstadt was created on the Beaver River below present-day Newcastle, Pennsylvania. So they established these missions, and within about 10 years, the white settlements encroaching once again, and the Native Americans to the west of them are very happy that they've become converted and that they're living like white men. And so, once again, they face trouble uh, with the, the people around them. Uh, the natives saw them as a sign of weakness that these people had decided to be converted to Christianity. So in the spring of 1771, Zeisberger gets invited to the Delaware Territory in Ohio by Chief, here's another one, Netawatoese. 
Uh, so he heads to the Tuscarawas Valley where he preaches what is considered the first Protestant sermon west of the Alleghenies at Gekulwamukpachunk, or Newcomer's Town. Uh, Nettawatawees and Zeisberger uh, kind of negotiate, and in the end, Nettawatawees invites him to bring the missions to the Tuscarawas Valley. Um, he gives him land from the former Tuscarawas, the capital, down to the Stillwater Creek, which is about a 10 mile area. So in the spring of 1772, Zeisberger and five families of converts come to the Tuscarawas Valley. Um, Nettawatawi suggested they settle at the Big Spring, so they go there and they found the village of Shunbrun. So that was 1772. Shunbrun means beautiful spring. Um, Shunbrun has been reconstructed, so this is not a photo from 1772, of course. <laughs> uh, but this was Shunbrun Village. Uh, they bring more of the Christian converts over from Pennsylvania. So the first ones that come here were not converted Delaware that lived here. They were converted Delaware and Mohegans that were in the Pennsylvania missions. And they, they transplant them to Ohio. Um, eventually Shunbrun has 60 to 70 buildings, two main streets, and the first church and the first school in Ohio. So this is one of the original maps that still exists. So you can see it's kind of in a T shape. Um, right in the center is the church and then the corner to the right is the schoolhouse. And then the, these were also rebuilt. Um, when Wineland and the school superintendents <coughs> formed the Historical Society, they used maps um, all this was farmland, but they just started searching and digging and they eventually found the um, fireplace for, I think it was the church first, and then um, Zeisberger's house was right beside it. And so they could find those places and, and rebuild on basically the, the right spots. So there was the church, and then this was the school. So the new Philadelphia school system, who was also the Quakers, by the way, <laughs> um, they like to talk about how New Philadelphia was the first school in Ohio since the, the Schoenbrunn School was pretty near there. Um, in September of 1772, um, one of the native assistants, assistants named Joshua took another group of converts from Pennsylvania and they founded Janate and Hutton on October 9th. And then in 1776, whoop, a third mission was founded um, at Lichtenau, which was near Coshocton. So that was in, in Coshocton County. So by 1776, they had three missions there. Um, the goal of the mission wasn't just to Christianize the Indians, but also to educate them as much as possible. Um, daily life was handled by the local government within the villages, so they actually set up governments, the first governments in Ohio, and they reported back to the mission board in Bethlehem. Uh, the principal rule was to bathe the teachers and the assistants and to live peaceably together. Trade was strictly regulated um, the, and they weren't allowed any intoxicating drink. Uh, to live in the villages, the Native Americans had to, we'll qu put it in quotes, quench their savage nature, acknowledge women as their equal, lay aside traditional ornaments and dress as white men. They had to plant, sow, and reap like a farmer and stay in one place instead of roaming and submit to the village reg regulations. And the mode of punishment was banishment from the village if they weren't willing to live that way. Um, Zeisberger, as I said, was very gifted in languages. He did a lot in that way to educate the, na the natives. He spoke many Native American languages fluently and he produced a number of written works that included um, Native American language, different dialects, uh, German and English. And so this is an example of one of the first school books that he translated um, and it gives examples of what the vowels would sound like. And then this is another page out of there where you can see he takes the Delaware language and um, this one is into English. And a number of these books still exist. So. Uh, this brings us to the events of the Revolutionary War and the missions there. Um, according to the booklet, 
The Tragedy of Jeanette and Hutton by Maur Maurice Order. Uh, the American Revolution brought unrest and disaster to the missions. Various tribes became involved on both sides and the missions lay in the direct path of the warriors as they went on their errands of destruction and bloodshed. Uh, the Moravians, as I said, were forbidden from going to war. Um, they remained neutral. Uh, during the war, they were forbidden from trading with the Indian parties that came through, not knowing whether the goods they carried might be plundered from um, Western settlers' villages. But they always offered hospitality to whoever came, whether it was British, whether it was the natives who supported the British, whether it was Americans who came through. They always off offered hospitality to everybody, and that was something that could sort of get them into trouble. Um, the peaceful Moravian influence did work to keep the Delaware tribe neutral through a lot of the Revolutionary War, um, but the direct line between Detroit and Fort Pitt was just something that really got in the way of trying to be a peaceful mission settlement all the time. Um, Fort Pitt was the chief American post, Detroit was the chief British post, and the British at Detroit worked to unite the Native Americans onto their side. And most of, the, of them did join the British. Uh, the British were seen as stronger. They were seen as wealthier. And uh, kind of most importantly, they were not the ones steadily moving west and taking their land. So the Delaware, they had three branches. One of them, um, led by Captain Pipe, was somewhat pro-British pro um, by the end of the war. And then Chief White Eyes and Nettawatoes advocated peace and neutrality for the other two branches of the Delaware. So in the spring of 1777, the natives at the mission in Shunbrun abandoned the mission. Um, they were just had too much traffic through there. It was unsafe for them. And so they moved to Lichtenau in an effort to keep safe. Um, they also suggested at that time to abandon Janate and Hutton so that all of them were together at Lichtenau, but the converts and their missionaries there wanted to stay put for the time being. So they stayed. Um, then in March of 1778, British agents Matthew Elliott, Alexander McKee, and Simon Gurdy arrived at Janate and Hutton uh, ready to cause trouble. Uh, they told the Delaware there no, they arrived at Coshocton, I'm sorry, um, they, at the Delaware capital. Um, they told the Delaware there that the Americans had lost the war, uh, that the British had prevailed, and that the Americans were coming west and were going to attack all the natives in the west so that they could take their land. Um, Chief White Eyes convinced the warriors not to go to war right away. He convinced them to give him 10 days so that they could find out if this was a rumor or if this was actually true. And so on the ninth day, Heckewelder came running in, uh, running in on his horse. Uh, he had been at Fort Pitt. They had gotten a little bit of word that these rumors had started. Heckewelder rode three days and two nights nonstop except to feed the horse, got to Coshocton in time and told them that it was untrue and that the Americans wanted to work with them and to keep the peace. Uh, he wasn't treated kindly at first when he got there, but eventually he convinced them that he was telling the truth. And so uh, White Eyes killed Buck, who succeeded Netawatoes after his death, and Captain Buck Pipe met with the Americans and agreed to give them free passage to Detroit in hopes of ejecting the British. Uh, they allowed them to build a fort in Delaware Territory. So in 1778, Fort Lawrence was built, and that's also near present-day Bolivar today. Uh, the fort was a big failure. That's a whole other lecture probably on Fort Lawrence. Um, the Indians surrounded it. The men ended up eating their moccasins to try to stay alive. Uh, it was terrible. So in 1779, Fort Lawrence was abandoned. Um, two different times, in 1778 and in 1779, uh, Janaton did abandon the village for a while and went to Lichtenau for safety. Um, and these two, these two maps show Shunbrunn, Janaton, Hutton, and Lichtenau on the left-hand side. And then um, after they abandoned it, in April of 1779, they went back to Janaton, and then a new mission was formed in New Shunbrun in 1779. This was about two miles from the original Shunbrun village. And then in March of 1780, they fully abandoned Lichtenau and founded the third mission again of Salem. So each time they had three missions, Shunbrun, Janaton, Lichtenau, 
Uh, they abandoned them, went back and forth a little bit. And then by 1780, we have New Shunbrun, Janain Hutton, and Salem. So at the end of that year, at the end of 1780, there were 143 residents at New Shunbrun, 135 at Janain Hutton. Uh, they were with a missionary named William Edwards, and 102 at Salem with John Hackewalder. And Zeisberger was at New Shunbrun. So there were a total of 380 converts. So even throughout the tumultuous times that they had had, uh, they had continued with the converts they brought from Pennsylvania and brought more in, um, converted more of the Delaware Indian in the area where they were. So the missions really were pretty successful uh, considering the circumstances that they were in. Uh, so 1780 ends pretty well. 1781 uh, was once again a very tumultuous year for the missions. Um, C.H. Knightley wrote a paper for college on the Moravians and says of Zeisberger, while he furnished Americans with valuable information, he was also instrumental in averting many frontier massacres by traveling warriors. He was by no means an American spy. Zeisberger's greatest desire was to be left alone with the Indians. So once again, he, he was hospitable to everyone who traveled through the area. Uh, but as, as the story continues, it's the same old story. The American frontiersmen were distrustful of the converts. Um, the British were distrustful. The other warriors were distrustful. So they're once again stuck in the middle. Um, both the British and Americans offered them safer places to live. The Americans offered them a place near Fort Pitt. The British offered to bring them closer to Detroit, but they just wanted to stay put in the Tuscarawas Valley. So finally things come to a head when two Moravian Braves are caught on the road to Fort Pitt. Um, they tell them they are spies and Captain Pipe convinces Com Commandant de Peister at Detroit that they need to bring in the mission, the mission theories and the Beto's captive and try them. So in August of 1781, Matthew Elliott and a contingent of 300 Wyandot Braves go to Janain Hutton with the intent to capture them. Uh, the Wyandot chief, Half King, says of the missions, you live in a dangerous place. Two mighty and wrathful gods stand opposed to one another with extended jaws, and you seated between them will be destroyed by one or the other, perhaps both, and will be crushed between their teeth. Uh, so Zeisberger works for about a month to negotiate with the Wyandotte what's going to happen. And finally, all of the Christian Indians from all three of the mission towns are taken north to Upper Sandusky, and then the missionaries are taken on to Detroit for trial. So this is the journey uh, that they take from New Shunbrun on the right hand side and then they end up in Upper Sandusky, um, they call it Captive Town. So what does it say, approximately 140 miles. Um, so the missionaries are gonna face trial in Detroit as American spies. Captain Pipe kind of orchestrated all of this, but in the end he didn't uh, press charges against them or was willing to testify against them and they were released. So during the winter of 1781-82 uh, the Moravian converts are at Upper Sandusky. They're quite miserable. They had not been able to build very good shelters. Uh, they didn't have very good food because they pretty much uh, just packed up what they could and left without much food to bring with them. But the missionaries returned by Christmas time. They celebrated Christmas and by springtime, uh, they weren't real sure what they were going to do. They were running out of supplies and they needed food. So they agreed to left, let a group of them go back to the Tuscarawas Valley, get the provisions they had left behind, and to get the corn from the fields. So they leave, go to go back to all three villages, um, Salem, New Shunbrun, and Janaton Hutton. At the same time, the Western Indians start attacking the frontier of Pennsylvania again. Uh, someone who was captured by one of the groups of warriors said that two Moravian Indians were with the group that had captured him. So once again, the, the, the Western settlers, American settlers become all riled up, uh, blame the villages for these attacks, that even if it isn't necessarily the Moravians attacking them, that the people are kind of based out of those villages that are coming to the east and attacking. So on March 3rd, 1782, 
165 men under the command of Colonel David Williamson set off for the Tuscarawas Valley from western Pennsylvania. In the meantime, one of the group of warriors that came through, the Indians that are out in the field decide to trade with them. They end up with a bloody dress. Uh, they take it as a trade. Now if you remember, one of the rules was they weren't supposed to trade with the warriors coming through. But uh, the missionaries aren't there with them, it's just the um, Arabian converts. So they trade with these warriors. Uh, end up with a dress that belonged to the Wallace family. The mother and five of the children were murdered by one of the raiding parties. So Williams Militia arrives at Janine Hutton on March 6th. They camp overnight without the converts knowing that they're there. And the next day they split into two groups. Uh, one group crosses the river. They come across one of the Moravians. His name was Joseph Shabash. They shoot him in the arm, tomahawk him, scalp him, and leave him dead by the side of the river. Uh, the other group went into the village and befend, befended the ones that were left there in the village, told them that they were there to help them and that they were going to take them to the safety of Fort Pitt. Uh, they convinced them to give up their weapons uh, with the promise that when they get back to Fort Pitt, they will give them back to them. So they give them their weapons and uh, they take them captive and lock them up in buildings. And this is Janine and Hutton today, so this is the site where this is going on. Um, so they take them captives. And the other group of militia was supposed to go round up the converts that were at Shunbrun and at Salem. Um, the group that was at Shunbrun had gotten a message from the um, missionaries at Upper Salem telling them to return. So they had a runner that was going down to Janine and Hutton to let them know that it was time to leave. Well, he came across the dead body of Shabash and could see the militia in the village at Shunbrun. So he turned back around, warned the ones, or in Janine Hutton, he warned the ones at Shunbrun that the militia was there and they uh, hid into the woods. So they didn't get caught. The other ones at Salem, the militia uh, met them in the fields, convinced them they were friendly once again, had nice conversations with them on the way back to Janine and then locked them up once they got there. Uh, so once they were locked up, they started scavenging through the village, the militia. They found the bloody dress and um, also all the utensils and things they had they claimed were stolen from white settlers when they had, had gone on raids, which wasn't true because they were farmers also. Uh, they were living as farmers in the villages. but. The militia was quite upset. They kind of hold a little mock trial, have, have the militia stand in line, and anyone who thought they should show mercy to the Moravians was to step forward. And only 16 or 18 of the men stepped forward out of the 165. Uh, the rest of them voted to kill the Moravian converts. Um, then they had to decide how they were going to kill them. Uh, one idea was to burn them alive in the buildings. The other idea was to tomahawk them and scalp them. So the latter was decided. They decided to tomahawk them. Uh, the Moravians asked to be allowed to prepare for death, so they were given the night to prepare. Uh, they began to sing and pray. And in the pamphlet, The Tragedy at Janaton, it states, there was but one thing to do, and that was to submit with Christian resignation and fortitude to what had to come believing that their savior would be there and help them. So details of the massacre come from two young braves who survived, and also um, a few of the militiamen were at one point in time willing to talk about what had happened. Uh, so the Christian Indians were separated, women and children in one building, men in the other, and then they were brought into two separate buildings, which the militia termed the slaughterhouses. Um, at that point in time, they were either hit with a mallet or a tomahawk and scalped and then thrown aside into heaps. Um, one boy who survived was named Thomas. And he actually got scalped but lived through it. Uh, he spent the night laying on the floor with the other dead bodies, um, pretending to be dead. In the middle of the night, he was able to escape and crawl to safety. Uh, another boy who survived was named Jacob. And while they were captive, he managed to crawl down into the cellar of the room. Um, he escaped out a window and hid in another cellar. Happened to be one of the slaughterhouses where he hid. And so he spent that day with blood dripping down on him. 
Um, and he also made his escape then at night. And eventually the two of them met up and they made their way to Sandusky to let the missionaries and those who were left behind know what had happened. Uh, the missionaries had been sent to Detroit, so they didn't learn about the events there until March 23rd. So altogether, 96 Native Americans were murdered that day, 40 men, 22 women, and 34 children. Uh, so it didn't matter, young or old, man or woman, uh, they were killed. Zeisberger actually has some journal entries. His journals survive, and there's journal entries about the massacre. He states that the militia had 96 scalps afterwards, but he knew that there were 86 Moravians that had returned for the harvest. He writes that the others must have been friends who did not belong to us. So it does bring up the interesting question of whether or not there were any of the raiding warriors actually in Janine Hutton at that point in time, since his journals say there were 86 and 96 of them um, were killed. Uh, this ended the mission in the Tuscarawas Valley at this point in time. They did not return. Um, they stayed in the upper Sandusky area, uh, eventually wandered in Michigan for a while. Uh, they did set up a mission in um, New Salem, they called it, which was near Milan, Ohio. And then eventually they settled in Fairfield in Canada. Uh, with the success, We'll put, we'll put success in quotes. With the success of the mission against the Moravians, uh, the Western Militia decided to bring another group into Ohio to go after the Native Americans. They were going to destroy the other Delaware villages and go after the Wyandots. So Colonel Crawford was elected to head this group. Uh, they came over into Ohio, uh, got surrounded by the Natives, a lot of them got killed, and in the end, uh, Colonel Crawford was captured and tortured until he died. So realizing, after the Revolutionary War was over, um, the American government realized the, what the Moravians had actually done, that they, they did work to keep peace, they did keep the Delaware Indians um, neutral for quite some time. Um, they did prevent some of the warring parties from heading east to the, to the settlements in Pennsylvania um, and also probably because of the massacre. They were given 12,000 acres of land in the land ordinance of 1785. Um, there were three, 4,000 acre tracks, the Salem track, the Janate and Hutton track, and the Shunbrun track. Um, these are two land maps from 1870 and right above the river you can see the lines that are going uh, diagonal rather than up and down and then also in the other one those are the Salem and the Janate and Hutton tracks so even on land maps in 1870 you can still see those areas uh, 12,000 acres was way more land than the Moravians were ever going to use uh, they did return Zeisberger did return to the Tuscarawas Valley in 1798 with 33 converts and set up a mission called Goshen on the Shun Run Tract. Um, but the rest of the land, John Heckewater was made the land agent and he leased or sold the land. Um, there are quite a few Moravians still in Tuscarawas County that did come over and settle but not near enough to take up all the acreage that they were given. Uh, by 1800 there were 71 inhabitants in Goshen uh, but life there was also still never easy. They still weren't trusted very much. Uh, they were always tempted by visitors and uh, life was just difficult. Um, and the one thing that Zeisberger always worried about, the last years of his life were deeply saddened by this one thing, the curse of drink, which the whites, white race brought upon their darker skinned brethren of the forest, which Zeisberger's uh, Diaries from Goshen are full of stories of when the different converts there would get drunk and he'd have to throw them out of the village for a while. So that was always a problem that he faced there. Uh, Zeisberger died in Goshen on uh, November 17, 1808. He is buried there in the cemetery. Um, the go number of natives in Goshen dwindled over the years and the last remnant left the Tuscarawas Valley in 1824. 
So this is a picture of uh, Zeisberger preaching at the top there, and then the cemetery and the original stone that was on it. Today there's a more modern stone on it. Um, the Tuscarawas County Historical Society actually still maintains Zeisberger's grave. And I think there's like 80 um, natives and whites buried in that little cemetery. Uh, this is the Indian mound where the uh, massacred Indians were buried. Um, for a lot of years, uh, through the end of the revolution and then after, people kind of avoided the Janine Hutton area. Um, there's stories of soldiers spending the night nearby and during a thunderstorm seeing a uh, native woman dancing with a line of skeletons uh, through the thunderstorm. Uh, so people kind of thought the valley was haunted a little bit after that, didn't come around very much. Uh, Tekawoda returned in 1797 to do surveying in the area. At that point when they got to Janayton they could still see where the uh, chimneys were. There was a lot of brush undergrowth. They could see uh, game trails where bears and fox and wolves went through. Uh, there were a lot of snakes in the area. So they set the brush on fire. Uh, once the once it was burned and cleared out, then they could see bones just scattered throughout the village. Uh, they figured animals had come in and drug them about. Uh, they do know the militia set it on fire when they left. Um, so they gathered the bones then, uh, basically 20 years later, and buried them in the mound there. And then uh, this is the memorial that was put up and I think it's 18, 1840s, it's 1850s, they erected the monument, I believe. Um, so that's still in the Janet and Hutton Cemetery today. And as I said, we do have quite a few Moravian churches still in the area. Um, and it's not something you see outside of Tuscarawas County very much. There's, there's ones in different parts of the country, but um, we have a... I don't know, there's probably 10 Moravian churches still left in Tuscarawas County. So, that concludes my program. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yes, and did the Moravians also settle Old Salem and Winston-Salem? Yes. Okay, because yes. okay, yep. I was there and I was going to say, I yep. think they were Moravian. That was another area. There's an area in uh, Michigan where there's still quite a few. Edmonton. Is that the okay. problem? Okay. Yeah. So there's different, there's like pockets of them. Instead of them being you know widespread, there's little pockets where they where they mention death of him. Yes. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Um, New Shunbra, is there a mar is there anything? To there's a, a pile of historical marker there. Okay. So it's on um, Route 416, going south out of New Philly towards a, another village in, called Tuscarawas. We like to use the word Tuscarawas all over the place in the county. Sure. So there's another village, not where the original uh, Delaware capital was, but another area called Tuscarawas. So there's a historic marker there. There's also one where Salem um, was located, which it is on Route 36 outside of Fort Washington. So over the years, the Historical Society did a pretty good job of marking where each one was located. And like I said, Shunburn Village is reconstructed. You can go visit it today. I think on the 21st, they have a lamp tour there. So. <laughs> yes, not that far. When you go into Dover, there's a big monument there. Who is that? Where is it? It's in Dover. In Dover. Went like out of Dover a little bit. I mean, I've been past it. I never stopped. It's huge. It was is it in the cemetery? <coughs> no. No. Dover. It's out towards. I don't think it has anything to do with the Moravians. Okay. I think it has to do with the Thor village or somebody that okay. that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'll have to stop next time I'm down there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Ask her. her. Yeah? Ask her. Uh, uh, where, where is Ganaden Hunt in response to where we are here in Salem? It's about an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, <coughs> south on 77. Okay. And then probably the easiest way is to get off at 36 at Newcomerstown okay. and turn right. You're going to go through Port Washington, and then you'll get to Janine Hutton. Okay. Okay. Or if you go, if you get off, if you go 250 and towards Eurexville, then you can get on 36 also, and then you'll get to Janine It's kind of in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> we just had a little festival down there a couple weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's probably another yeah, 20 minutes. Yeah, very common. Mm -hmm. 15 minutes area. from Shinebrun. And they, they have two little buildings at Janine Hutton. Um, I've never been in them, but I know they've been trying recently to have them open more often, the little museum buildings that are there. And then the Moravian Church in Janine Hutton is the John Heckewalder Moravian Church, Memorial Moravian Church, and they have uh, quite a nice archives in there <coughs> also of material. Certainly not a new photograph. That was that one called, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but you should see them when I saw it. Any more questions? You can't feel today. Oh. Thank you for having me. I'm not sure. I'm going to invite you to join us in a refreshment. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to ask them. And don't forget to check out all the upcoming events on the board on your way out. We'll see you next month.